Good evening. If you are in Eastern Canada, good afternoon. If you are in Western Canada, and if you are in Japan or uh, Singapore or further east, good morning. I'm Colin Robertson, your host for this webinar that over the next 90 minutes, we'll look at how we can improve supply chain resiliency in the Indo-Pacific. To lead the discussion, I welcome our five distinguished panelists. Stephen Neji is a CJA Fellow and Senior Associate Professor at the International Christian University in Tokyo. Stephen also put this webinar together, so thank you, Stephen. Kazuto Suzuki is Professor of Science and Technology Policy, the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. Amitendu Pallet is Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Don Buber is the is a geologist and president and CEO of Avalon Advanced Materials, Inc. Sarah Goldfeder is a CJI fellow and former US diplomat, currently part of the public policy team at General Motors Canada. Their full biographies, as well as the papers they wrote for this session are on the CJA website. For listeners, global supply chains were designed for economic efficiency and just-in-time delivery. But as we are learning, that only works when there is agreement on norms and rules and there are no disruptions because of geopolitics, climate or pandemics. But even before the current pandemic, the trend towards restrictive rules of origin as a part of managed trade agreements, investor and consumer expectations on ESG requirements and fast encroaching timelines to reduce carbon emissions led companies to consider localizing their supply chains using joint ventures and memorandums of understanding to vertically integrate their supplies. With the pandemic and rising tensions with China, the security of health products and critical minerals is now a critical concern for governments. The risk factor has increased. National security is now factored into the equation and security trumps economic efficiency. Throughout the pandemic, Canadians felt the effect of disruptions in supply chains, especially when it came to masks and health equipment. Most of those supply chains are rooted in the Indo-Pacific. We also came to understand the weaponization of those chains when planes sent to China to pick up purchased health equipment came home empty. At home, we have our own problems caused by floods, fires, and now those occupying downtown Ottawa and at our critical border crossings. Getting stuff back and forth across our US border is especially critical to the auto industry. It's a topic that we now discuss as part of the Canada-US road map, as well as the, at the G7 and G20, and in bilateral discussions with our main trainee partners. One of President Biden's first actions was to issue an executive order mandating a review of supply chains as they relate to semiconductors, critical minerals, large-scale batteries, and medical resources. Japan, Australia, and India launched a supply chain resilience initiative around vaccines and medical supplies, and the Quad has followed suit and included semiconductors in the scope of their work. Supply chain resilience is the overriding theme for today's economy, and while our panelists will deal with supply chains across the board, obviously for Canada, the auto industry is of fundamental importance. Some of the questions that our panelists will deal with include, how do we assure and improve resiliency? Do we diversify? Do we decouple? Do we reshore? How do we create reliable and secure mutual dependencies with trusted trading partners? How do we ensure supply chains conform with our human rights, environmental, and labor standards? And finally, how do we manage this in a federation where provincial governments have a constitutional responsibility for trade and ownership of natural resources is often shared with our First Nations? Our discussion this evening will begin with each panelist taking eight minutes or so to share their paper's analysis and recommendations. Then we'll address your questions. So please use the question and answer function throughout our webinar. My colleague, CJI President David Perry, will collate them and post them to our panelists. So let's get started. And Stephen, let me ask you to lead off. Thanks very much, Colin, and please just let me start by expressing my thanks to my co-panelists, uh, Sarah, Amatindu, uh, Kazuto, Don, as well as the CGI staff, um, yourself, Dave, and Charlotte, and Adam in Calgary that have put a lot of effort in making this happen. 
So I'd like to just uh, touch upon three points in my discussion and my opening remarks today. First, how I understand the critical junctures that have shifted our thinking about, critical, uh, about supply chains in the Indo-Pacific. Second, some of the tools that I think that are uh, emerging in terms of dealing with some of the supply chain initiatives within the region. And lastly, I just want to uh, re-emphasize that uh, building resilience into supply chains and diversifying supply chains really doesn't uh, mean that we are decoupling from uh, the Chinese economy. Rather, we're recalibrating our economic footprint and our trade footprint uh, with the, uh, the Chinese economy so that we're better insulated from some of the shocks that can happen domestically within the Chinese context, but also deal with some of the geopolitical challenges that are emerging associated with the US-China strategic competition. In terms of critical junctures, I understand three primary critical junctures in terms of shifting thinking in Canada and amongst like-minded countries like Japan or the United States, Australia, and India. The first critical juncture, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic, which emerged out of Wuhan, China, in uh, late October, early November, 2019. The initial response by the Chinese government was to lock down uh, the city and the region. And this region is home to semiconductor supplies, automobile suppliers, pharmaceutical supply, uh, suppliers, and many others. Uh, the shutdown had global ramifications for uh, global supply chains linked to these particular industries. And for Canadians, this affected everything from personal protective equipment, to uh, how with our uh, parts that go in our automobiles uh, here in Canada. The second critical juncture in my understanding really has to do with the weaponization of trade and supply chains uh, really and, and, and the um, primary, uh, I guess, um, victims of this uh, economic coercion has been Australia, but other countries like uh, Canada, uh, uh, Japan, of course, and most recently Lithuania. Uh, when the Australians called for an international investigation of the origins of COVID-19 pandemic, we saw uh, trade and supply chains be weaponized by China to try to change the domestic political calculus uh, within Canberra uh, in terms of its positions. And we've seen this economic coercion and the weaponization of supply chains really uh, be used against uh, other countries to try and change uh, their geopolitical calculus and interfere in their political decisions domestically. The third uh, area, which I think is really interesting, um, has to do with the 2010 rare earth embargo uh, on uh, Japanese, uh, on Japan, following the arrest of a Chinese fisherman uh, in and around the Senkaku Islands. Here, uh, those rare earth materials were, um, there was an informal embargo, and those rare earth materials or critical minerals really are critical to uh, many technologies that go in many of the signature products that Japan produces, in particular automobiles. So these three critical junctures have really shifted our thinking about how we need to think about supply chains and economic security. In terms of the instruments that are being developed to deal with some of these challenges, I think the most recent initiatives are the Resilient Supply Chain Initiative, which has emerged out of uh, Tokyo, Canberra, and Delhi. Uh, these three countries have decided to uh, invest in a selective diversification of supply chains through South Asia and South Asia. This isn't meant to decouple from China, it's meant to recalibrate and create alternative supply chain hubs so that we're less susceptible to some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier. Second, the quadrilateral security dialogue has become uh, a vehicle to uh, uh, inculcate more resilient supply chains, uh, more resilience into supply chains. And we saw that with the March, 2021 readout where uh, Australia, the United States, uh, Japan, and India agreed to invest in technology supply chains, regulations, as well as uh, to boost uh, vaccine production and distribution. The Quad now has become one of the primary vehicles to uh, build resilience into supply chains. Uh, there are other bilateral and multilateral um, uh, initiatives that are emerging in terms of dealing with a supply chain resilience within the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I assume that these will focus on technology, in particular semiconductor technologies that uh, Professor Suzuki will be speaking about in his presentation. These critical technologies are found in our, our phones, our, our uh, airplanes, and cars, and currently there's a bottleneck associated with production, but also uh, concerns about uh, the weaponization of uh, these technology supply chains and how they could affect our technologies within the region. 
So with that, I think just charting out a role moving forward for Canada, Canada has comparative advantages in terms of critical materials, which Don Bubar will talk about. Um, it has comparative advantages in terms of uh, supplying energy to the region. And it's comparative advantages in terms of its uh, relationships with uh, Japan and other like-minded countries in terms of developing supply chains for automobiles, which Sarah will be speaking about uh, later in today's uh, discussion. Canada needs to leverage its comparative advantages, uh, its partnerships within the region, and its rule of law, uh, rule of law and good governance to uh, have a critical uh, Canadian angle in terms of building resilience uh, into supply chains in the Indo-Pacific. With that, Colin, I'll pass the uh, lectern off to you. Okay, uh, Admiral Stephen, you've kept to the time very much so. Uh, Professor Suzuki, let me invite you to uh, now take the podium and share with us from your splendid paper. And again, a just reminder to the audience, all the papers are available on the CJI website in both English and French. Well, um, thank you, Colin, and uh, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me, and thank you, CJI, to, uh, to holding this uh, very interesting um, seminar. Um, I, my name is Kazuto Suzuki. I am very happy to, to join the discussion from uh, Japanese side, although uh, Stephen also reside in Japan, so I think he, uh, he covered uh, most of the, what, I, what I need to say. But anyway, um, so um, I like to mention a couple points. Uh, one is that the supply chain resilience, when we talk about supply chain resilience, one of the problem is that there are intentional and unintentional disruption of the supply chains. Uh, intentional ones, the, as uh, Stephen mentioned, they are Ch Chinese using the um, economic coercion to, uh, to stop and, uh, and put the pressure on the uh, foreign governments to change their policies. And this was the case in 2010 when the, there was a, 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 a the Japan captured the uh, uh, captain of the uh, fisher, uh, fisherman's boat. And currently uh, it is exercised in Australia, Lithuania, uh, Hungary, uh, uh, the uh, Norway, etc. And of course, Taiwan uh, is the main target. Uh, but also, I think that this is happening uh, also in, uh, in case of Russia. Uh, for example, there is uh, a threat of R uh, Russia stopping the supply of the natural gas uh, to Europe, and uh, Japan is supporting the, uh, to, to divert the uh, shipment of the uh, liquid natural gas to, to Europe. So that's another uh, case. And uh, China and Russia are, are, are pretty much um, uh, masterminded to, uh, to use uh, an economic tools to pressure on the other countries. And in that circumstances, Japan is now uh, trying to launch an initiative to, uh, to set an economic security. Um, the current Kishida administration has set up the new ministerial post on the economic security posted uh, to the young uh, energetic uh, politician, uh, Mr. Kobayashi. And uh, this is basically to, uh, to build up the resilience of the industry, um, uh, particularly in the critical uh, infrastructure and the critical um, uh, critical items, but also it is to prevent the erosion of the, uh, advan the Japanese uh, supreme uh, technologies and, uh, and trying to maintain the Japanese uh, economic competitiveness. So it can be a sort of a mix of the industrial policy as well as the security policy. And that's the interesting part, but I think this is all, all response to not only the intentional um, uh, supply chain disrupt, uh, disruption, but also the unintentional ones. Uh, for example, the uh, change of the uh, uh, a balance of the supply and demand or, or um, a natural, uh, natural disaster, you know, stopping the uh, operation of the factories, such as in case of the, you know, the uh, cold weather in Texas. Uh, which had an impact on the supply of the semiconductor. And uh, what is also interesting is that the Japan has invited the uh, uh, factory of the TSMC, the Taiwanese Semiconductor Foundry. Um, and this is uh, an interesting phenomenon because there are 
a, a sort of a competition among the friends. Uh, for example, the United States has invited the TSMC to build the factory in Arizona. And also um, Europeans wanted to build the, uh, the uh, to invite TSMC, but they failed. So there was a sort of a competition among friends to uh, to uh, to build the resiliency of the supply chain of the uh, uh, of, of semiconductor. And I think this is another aspect that we need to discuss. Uh, so it's not just you know uh, to to respond to the uh, to the enemies, but also we need to coordinate among the allies. And um, there are a number of um, issues how to uh, improve the resilience. And I think uh, Stephen has mentioned the bilateral uh, bilateral agreement, for example, Japan U.S. Uh, Competitiveness and Resilience Partnership, Core par Partnership, Japan, Australia, India Supply Chain Resilience Initiative on the, um, uh, on the vaccines and the, uh, and the medical equipments, Quad Initiative for setting up a working groups on the semiconductors, uh, critical minerals, etc. So there are a number of uh, ways in which that we can improve the resilience, but the other in, uh, interesting aspect is the improvement of of resilience by innovation. Um, for example, when uh, when China stopped supplying the uh, uh, rare earth mineral to Japan in 2010, the which these uh, minerals are important for Japan to build the hybrid car. But the Honda has uh, innovated, uh, created an a engine which doesn't require the Chinese origin, uh, origin uh, uh, critical minerals and to avoid the dependence on certain materials which are pretty much dependent on China. So again, I, I agree with Stephen that this is not about the decoupling, but I think this is more uh, more uh, uh, push to, uh, to encourage the innovation uh, among ourselves. And also what is interesting is that the, even though it's not institutionalized, the, when the China has exercised the economic coercion against Australia, the Japan and the rest of the world is trying to buy as much as the, the, the uh, agricultural goods uh, from Australia as much as possible. And uh, it is uh, typical of the case on Taiwan when China has uh, pr prohibited to import the pineapples from ta Taiwan, then the Japan was the Japan uh, improved, I think, about 700% uh, uh, of the imports of the Taiwan uh, pineapples of Taiwan. So even though there is no institutional framework of uh, building resilience, but the economic alliance is uh, also very important. So in that context, I think the Quad and the G7 and particularly this uh, uh, informal um, coordination among the uh, friends and allies is, is extremely important. Finally, I like to mention uh, when we talk about the supply chain resilience, we need to remind ourselves that the you know still the, the Japanese, Australian, uh, United American, Can Canadian economy depends heavily on China. So we need to distinguish what is the critical and strategic uh, elements and what is not. So we keep on uh, making a, a free trade with China while we are separating the critical and strategically important uh, items away from the, uh, the principles of the, uh, of the free trade. But meanwhile, we need to maintain our uh, free trade principles to make sure that you know um, the, we, the, these actions are uh, WTO compatible and uh, and in, in certain cases it requires the reform of the WTO. So I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Kazuto. I just I want to follow up with one question, and that you know you talked about the semiconductor plant going down in Arizona, I know Texas was bidding for it and there's one perhaps going there. And then you said the Europeans were competing for it and saying, well, we should try and work this out so we don't have this kind of competition. But do you think that's really possible? Certainly my experience of watching auto plants over the past 40 years and their placement, you get in our two federations, Canada, and the United States, you get states and provinces battling with one or another, let alone federal governments. So 
I guess I would I would you know come back to you and say, do you think it's really possible for us to to be able to agree? Uh, I think we would agree that we need the resiliency, but do you think that it's possible that we can actually agree where the placement will take place, just given both national and uh, regional aspirations and the, the natural flow of politics? Um, that's uh, that's a tough question to to answer. <laughs> I think it's it's also tough because it's not just the, the federal uh, local governments, but also the companies, TSMC uh, yes. strategic decision. So it it's all up to the uh, TSMC whether they are interested in having the you know uh, subsidies from these local governments or the national governments. And uh, yes, there is a competition among the friends, but uh, also I, I think what is important is that the the supply chain is not hostaged by the uh, the China. I mean, if there is only Taiwanese or, or ta the com the company only has a factory in Taiwan, then there will be a, a a higher risk if there is a let's say a blockade or Chinese uh, coercion to to stop physically stop the, the trade. So I think having the multiple location in uh, the of the multiple location of the production uh, of the semiconductor in the different countries, that is already a hedge on the risk. And uh, it, the, the rest is all up to the TSMC's, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategic decisions. So basically, you're talking about a kind of trusted partnership amongst mutual friends, which I know is one of the points you bring out in your paper. Well, thank yeah. you very much. Dr. Pallet, delighted to hear from you now. Thank you so much, uh, Colin. And uh, let me begin by thanking the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, Stephen, and everybody else for this fantastic opportunity. I think to me, what is uh, a very interesting uh, point to be noted is that uh, when it comes to resilience of supply chains, uh, th this wasn't something new. Uh, supply chains have been getting disrupted for about 10 to 15 years, uh, well from the end of the first decade of the current century, extreme weather events, the Fukushima earthquake, the Thailand floods, lots of disruptions. But the point is that supply chains were never discussed with as much intensity and as much involvement as they are being discussed after the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously something has happened to supply chains around the COVID-19, which really makes the subject extremely significant and important. And I think there are two factors to be noted in that regard. Uh, the first, Stephen alluded to the fact that uh, Wuhan uh, was kind of the first uh, instance which really uh, made the world sit up and take note of the fact that how widely disruptive uh, sourcing breakdowns can be. And Wuhan is a place which has uh, nearly a thousand Fortune 500 companies uh, having their establishments over there. So it was Wuhan that first drew attention to the fact that supply chain disruptions need not be localized. They can be very globalized. And this is what the COVID-19 pandemic of exogenous shocks like that can create. And it's not limited to China because moving on from 2020, when the pandemic settled down deeper and much more extensively in Southeast Asia, we noticed in 2021 that lockdowns in Malaysia, Thailand, and even in Taiwan actually led to the chip shortage in the semiconductor industry, which is yet to be addressed fully. So it's not just one particular country or the disruptions over there. It's the sequence and the series and the extent by which countries can be affected, which can really bring this uh, whole industrial uh, sort of landscape to a halt. And uh, I think I'd also like to allude to the fact that the conversation around supply chains has been limited to industrial supply chains, but one has rarely uh, taken note of the great disruptions that can be caused to food supply chains. If, say, for example, the major food and primary exporters of the world, including in Africa, get affected by such disruptions. The second point which COVID-19 brought out, I think, is the fact that, uh, Colin, you alluded to this in your early remarks, the national security dimension. There are industries which are important to countries from a national security perspective, and many of these industries have developed peculiar sourcing dependencies over the last 15 to 20 years of that functioning. And let me bring that in with a specific country context. Uh, let me bring this in from the point of view of the pharmaceuticals industry. 
and that of the case of India. As we know that India is a country which has a, a very robust generic drug producing industry, making affordable finish dose formulations for the rest of the world, including biologics. But over the years, this country depends very heavily on China for the supply of drug intermediates. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic brought up a certain complicated dimension of this dependency when India realized that the COVID-19 pandemic and the sourcing dependency is taking place on the back of the fact that they are, it is clashing with China in the high Himalayas, which is actually leading to loss of lives. And if that creates a situation where China is inclined to, quote unquote, weaponize, the fact that it is a major supplier of pharmaceutical ingredients to India, then the Indian pharmaceutical industry is stuck. The entire public health security of the country is at stake. Now, this probably is a concern which was shared in a much wider group of countries. That is where we see the resilient supply chain initiative taking shape between Japan, Australia, India. That is where we see the quad coming up and resulting in a large number of similar collaborative options. But the point that I would like to bring up here is that how come all this happened? Why has there been so much of sourcing dependency? I think we need to go back to the basics and understand the fact that the sourcing dependency has not happened exogenously. It has been a result of very careful, economically efficiency driven business decisions taken by companies running major supply chains over the years, and particularly after the formation of the WTO, which has today led to a situation that a lot of countries have outsourced big parts of their supply chains to certain countries, foremost among them China, which now gets to have a near monopoly in the supply of the supposedly lower end materials of a supply chain. Now, what that essentially means is that if at any point in time anything goes wrong in China, or for that matter, other countries which enjoy similar source independency, the supply chains crack. Now, this is something for which I'm not too sure whether one can directly blame China, because ultimately, it is a result of business decisions, again, fostered by economic efficiency. And if economic efficiency is the guiding logic, then the businesses would want this current supply chain to be maintained the way it is. Because China continues to remain an economically efficient location, but the geopolitical context of the resilience now makes the situation very different. So while countries from a national security perspective would want the businesses to reshore, reorganize their supply chains, the point is, are businesses willing to play ball? And that is where the entire question of incentivizing this relocation is becoming very, very important. And that is where the financial incentives have started flowing. Uh, we can discuss more on this during our discussions. But I think the challenge now is essentially for businesses to accept geopolitical logic with a certain degree of conviction that, well, if they do reshore, if they minimize the source independency, if they pull back out of China in substantive fashion, then at least that's not going to be economically damaging for them in the medium and long term. I think this is a conflict, a policy conflict, a strategic conflict, which the Indo-Pacific and larger supply chains across the world are going to contend with in the foreseeable future. I'll stop there, Colin. Uh, Amitendra, thank you very much. And actually the point you raise about, this really ultimately comes down to business. Yes, there are geopolitical pressures on them, but will they make the decision? It's a bit like uh, Professor Suzuki talking about TMC making its decision despite the pressures. What evidence do you see that the geopolitics is of such weight that companies actually are now beginning to move, given that there are some incentives out there? Colin, one of the examples that come to my mind is that uh, Foxconn, for example, has been setting up operations across the world, including in India, and it's gone into collaborations with Indian um, manufacturers to produce fabrication units. But I think the point that is important to note over here is that when we look at strategic industries, not all countries are actually well-placed to accept and host the relocated supply chains. These countries need to be 
deep, solid, and stable insofar as the political conditions, doing business conditions, and the scale accommodation is concerned. Uh, there was a lot of talk about Vietnam uh, being a major, major beneficiary of this relocation. I think uh, that narrative completely overlooked the fact that Vietnam had already reached the tipping point because the US-China tariff war had resulted in the price effect driven relocation getting located substantively in Vietnam. Vietnam doesn't have that size. Then who's prepared to take the reshoring? I think this again is a question which needs very deep thinking. And probably what is missing in the story out here is that when countries like India, Japan, and Australia decide to float a resilience supply chain initiative, have they thought through that by what extent their incentives are in congruence with each other? If they are not then there's not going to be much result out of it, I'm afraid. Hmm. Matendu, thank you very much. And I also want to underline your point about it, we're not only looking at sort of semiconductors and industrial goods, but we also need to look at food chains down the lower. I think that's an important point. Let me now pass the baton on to now Don Bubber. Don? Thanks, Colin. Pleasure to be here. And uh, actually, I'm representing the Mining Association of Canada as the member that has the most experience in what it takes in terms of challenges and opportunities to get these non-traditional mineral critical mineral supply chains uh, started here in Canada. And for sure, it's mostly about collaboration on strategies with countries in the Indo-Pacific region like Japan. And actually, I have a lot of experience in that too, having been a company well positioned to create a rare earth supply chain when China imposed the export quotas there back in 2010 and had a lot of dialogue with Japanese companies that were looking for alternative supply. And we almost got there actually. Then they relaxed the export quotas in China and we just couldn't get the the commitments to get the ball over the line to get into production. When we learned a lesson <laughs> that uh, it's all about timing and having that firm commitment from the end users of these non-traditional commodities to allow these uh, supply chains to get started. So it's all about now a strategy. Now there's more discussion on it. We need to strategize with more with countries like Japan on how we can collaborate on getting these critical mineral supply chain started. When I talk about this subject quite often in government circles to help uh, educate people on what's gonna take to get these started because it's a basically a very different industry to the traditional mining industry in Canada. You have to get some rock out of the ground, but after that, it's what you do with it to turn it into a derivative product that can then be used in the applications that need it. So it's actually more like a manufacturing business. Advanced manufacturing is how we're now trying to uh, characterize it. And we need to get more of the demand for these materials in order to justify the investment in starting to uh, create the supply because, and that has to come from international sources because in Canada, we've never developed any domestic demand for any of these non-traditional commodities like rare earths and lithium and a whole basket of others. So there's just not a lot of experience here on where to find them and what to do with them to get these supply chains started. But we're starting to get people better informed that it's all about finding the demand to justify creating the uh, supply. Because we've, as I say to government, We've got them all on the ground. We're we gonna leave them there or are we gonna take advantage of them to help create these new supply chains and the opportunities for uh, new business in Canada. So that's basically a win-win-win all the way around and uh, working closely with in countries in the Indo-Pacific region on this strategy, I think is, is um, ideal for both parties to benefit from this uh, going forward. So that's what I'm keen to talk about here today. And I've got a number of ideas on how we might be able to get there. <clears throat> and because it's so much about the creating the demand, one of the, the opportunities I think the Canadian government would have to help provide support for getting these supply chains started in Canada is create a strategic material stockpile that would then 
could be then be started by providing offtake commitments to aspiring new producers who have these resources in the ground but have no domestic demand to start production. And then by having the supply available in Canada, you can then attract the attention of international end users to create that demand for the product. And ultimately it's a win-win all around where maybe that inspires more companies that have innovated the products that use these non-traditional commodities to establish more manufacturing capacity in Canada to take advantage of having access to these commodities that you won't find anywhere else. So that's uh, uh, something I'm trying to get some support for now that I think would make a big difference. And if um, we can get the some um, voices chiming in from the Indo-Pacific region to support that would um, be very, very helpful. Then um, it's all about innovation too, at the end of the day on coming up with uh, not only innovation on applications for these non-traditional commodities, but innovation on efficient extraction processes to recover them in very efficient ways that minimize the environmental impacts to meet the criteria now on sustainability for production of these. And there's a, quite a lot of research happening in uh, that area now actually on how these can be produced in much more sustainable ways than they were in the past. Because in the traditional mining industry, which was only ever about bulk exchange traded commodities, building a mine was just about making it as big as you possibly can to keep your operating costs as low as possible, as opposed to trying to make a product to serve the needs of the market. In this case, it's about the demand and meeting the needs of the marketplace. So starting off at a modest scale and then growing your business over time. Again, foreign concept to the traditional mining industry. And uh, it also needs to be conveyed because of the greatly reduced impacts on the environment if you do that route in terms of getting it compared to a traditional large scale open pit mining operation for coal or copper, any traditional commodities. <clears throat> and one of the opportunities I've been trying to inspire interest in is uh, looking at closed mine sites as opportunities to recover these critical minerals from the tailings and the waste. They've always been treated as perpetual liabilities because of the environmental issues. But now we can go back to these sites because most of them are developed for one traditional commodity where the rock had all kinds of other elements in it that are sitting there in the waste and just take samples and start to work on innovative ways to recover these elements of interest. And you can recover them without doing any mining and remediate the long-term environmental liability while you do it. So many examples of historic mine sites that create that potential. So that's another one we're focusing on, but the main thing is to help people understand just how different a business this is. So the regulations governing creating these critical mineral supply chains can adapt to actually help encourage these new supplies to get started. Then there won't be any problem in creating the supplies because as I like to say, We've got them all on the ground. Are we going to leave them there or are we going to take advantage of our natural resource wealth here in Canada to meet the needs of the Indo-Pacific region and other parts of the world? And I can leave it at that. Thanks, Don. Don, I want to pose a question to you. I, I take your point about the, the need for demand uh, and the government should be sort of working on that piece of it. You know, we're starting to see this with as we move to electric vehicles and our strategic minerals and things. But then when you talk about kind of creating a strategic reserve, I think of the strategic petroleum reserve, you know, the Americans have done it. I think we tried it for a bit, but that's, that's hard to manage governments. In a, you know, I would have thought you coming from industry, industry doesn't always like to see governments move into uh, <laughs> supply management. It's uh, it remains controversial. I remember the green industry, uh, they know that we've got the one reservoir left in dairy, and that's still controversial. Do you, do you really think this could we could make a go of this in Canada um, on the strategic reserve side? Well, I'd like to think so because there is a precedent for doing the same thing in the, in the United States for accumulating stockpiles of all the 
materials needed in defense technologies. And we would do it probably in conjunction with our allies, the United States, a bit like Amatindu and other and kind of pointed out that we do this in collaboration. Stephen's saying that if a number of countries come together, because the financing for this is going to be substantial. Well, yeah, but um, get the money back too by selling it. <laughs> you know, you right, start which, to get the demand. But in our country, we've got to re- we don't have we're not capital rich. We really have to bring in the investment, don't we? Yes. And that's one of the things I've been working on, why I'm delighted to be engaged (laughs) again in the Indo-Pacific region, is finding those international investors that are keen to support the creation of these supply chains. All right. Well, thanks very much. Well, let's now move to an industry which uses a lot of these materials and minerals. Uh, Sarah Goldfeder, please. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And um, thank you all of you for for joining, for uh, inviting me to join into this conversation. And I've been trying to figure out exactly how to where to start, because there's a couple of different pathways that you can you can consider when you're looking at specifically at the automotive supply chain. But I think I'll start with USMCA, because that has really informed how the North American market has to consider its supply chains for automobiles. And so at the same time as we were renegotiating NAFTA. Um, and reestablishing a regional value content that's you know as high as it's ever been inside of it inside of a trade agreement. But we were also undergoing a massive transformation within the auto sector, um, and so there's kind of a dual pressure on OEMs today. Where if their marketplace is North America, they need to conform to these new um, high RVCs or regional value content, and at the same time, they're, they're, most of the traditional OEMs are starting to establish a parallel manufacturing process for battery electric vehicles, and there'll be a period of time, and we're in the middle of it right now, where those two Uh, supply chains are kind of operating um, in tandem. So you still have a supply chain and a manufacturing center focused on internal combustion engines. And at the same time, you you have OEMs racing to develop new supply chains to support the uh, battery electric vehicles that most of the OEMs have, have committed to for the future. So those things combined with um, also a new pressure to um, identify a high ESG rating for investors and for consumers have really um, created a set of pressures that the OEMs have to address. And so when you look at those um, and you look at the North American market specifically, there is a desire for closer proximity of the entire supply chain. And so you see right now um, in the last year, all of the major OEMs making declarations of um, partnerships and joint ventures, um, looking for you know lithium in the Salton Sea, for example, um, and you know as well as partnerships with you know, com- com- companies that come from various countries that have a lot of the um, expertise to bring to the table and the innovation to bring to the table to create sustainable, um, ec- you know, environmentally, relatively environmentally friendly processes for the upstream battery, battery uh, raw material supply chain. And so the other part of this that I think is really important to consider is that there are, really three major marketplaces for um, for the automotive industry. And one is North America, one is Asia, and the and the third is Europe. And most of the um, most auto companies have a preferred area or preferred region that they operate out of. But many of them also play in one or two of those other areas, those other regions. And so what they're doing at the same time is they're as they're seeking out out and trying to establish these new supply chains is some level of duplication so that they have um, regional hubs essentially that will supply those regions marketplaces. Because one of the things that we have to consider when we look at how we're developing our, in, you know, our supply chains is a combination of three factors. One being logistics, um, you know, how we get things into, into our supply chain and eventually to the consumer. And another being um, you know the trade agreements and market access that we have to that we have to operate within, um, and then, sorry, and then lastly, again, this consumer and investor um, focus of um, consumer and, and sorry, I'm I guess I'm glitching a bit. I don't know if that's my <laughs> my internet. So 
I think that those are really the, you know, when we talk about the automotive sector, those are the things that we want to consider. Um, and, and it's pretty rich for, for discussion, I think. Um, and I know, you know, from the North American perspective, we're looking more and more at a level of innovation coming out of Asia. But how do we kind of home, you know, how do we focus more within North America on applying these systems as we look to uh, lowering a carbon footprint of the actual process of the automobile? So I'll hand it back over to you, Colin. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And just, I'm just going to follow up on your last observation that I find really interesting that we're looking now to Asia for uh, innovation, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, the environmental side, because you always think of us here in North America having the pressure on and being innovative, finding it expensive, but we're still dealing with it. But what you're saying is we're actually picking up things from, from Asia. I, I find that interesting. Well, I think one of the things that, that is important to note is that there's been an uptake of, of EVs, especially within the Chinese market. And so there's been an establishment of one or two life cycles of these EVs in, in Asian markets, what we haven't seen in North America. North America is really the laggard and as far as actual adoption. Um, both Europe and Asia are ahead of the game. And so there's a lot of the innovation in how do we support the grid? How do we actually process um, the entire you know, life cycle of batteries and other materials that go into those vehicles that is actually happening in other marketplaces right now? And what you're also saying, I think, Sarah, is that having had a couple of generations that because we, again, sometimes I think North America, we're the leaders on the environmental front. But what you're saying is that for business reasons and other reasons within Asia, particularly in China, where pollution is a challenge, they're actually taking this quite seriously and they're working and there are things we can learn from them. Absolutely. I mean, there are also some level of leapfrog in, 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 this, in this effect, right? That there is the opportunity, one of the vehicles that, that you'll see, one of the electric vehicles that's quite popular in China is, is a very economical, smaller electric vehicle. Um, and that car is really marketed as an alternative to walking, as opposed to um, an alternative to a large truck, for example, like we have in North America. Thank you. Well, uh, panelists, thank you. You've been remarkably concise. We now have about 45 minutes left uh, for questions and answers. And again, I would encourage the audience to use the Q&A function. My colleague, Dave Perry, is going to be collating them. And I'm now going to turn to Dave to uh, give us the first uh, question or so that we can pose to our panelists. OK, uh, so the first one uh, comes in um, referencing the comments uh, about China, but as well as noting uh, the Trump administration's um, uh, tough trade policies and ask, isn't achieving supply chain resilience more a matter of bolstering competitiveness in source and destination markets, uh, which are both goals of both the Belt and Road Initiative as well as the America Compete bills? Well, thanks, Dave. I'll go backwards. I'll start with you, Sarah. <laughs> That might be better suited to some of the others, I think. All right, I'll, well, we'll, we'll give you an absolutely pass. All right, let me go to you, Stephen. You're muted, Stephen. So thank you very much for the question. Uh, in, in my understanding, the American Compete Bill and the BRI are really fundamentally different in terms of the construction. I think if you take a granular look at the American Compete Bill, it really uh, spans across multiple different sectors. Of course, there's the technology sector, there's the resilient supply chain sector, there's a sourcing uh, aspect of the, uh, of the American uh, Compete Act. Uh, but when you look into the Belt Road Initiative, really there's, it's, it's non-binding agreements with uh, BRI partners that are focusing on infrastructure connectivity. There's more a focus on the digital economy. And really it's China's efforts really to uh, reshape, I think, um, uh, the Indo-Pacific's regional integration strategy, uh, regional integration pattern in a way that um, is done through uh, geoeconomics. Uh, there's not really a rules-based process, but I think China is determined to lock in countries that agree to uh, its, its BRI initiatives. So I, I think that we're comparing apples and oranges here uh, and that um, I, I wouldn't put them in the same box. Thanks, Stephen. Amatendo, do you want to come in on this? Colin, I think <clears throat> I, I need to uh, sort of, uh, as I shared earlier, and I think that's the sentiment which is uh, getting reflected at the back of this question. 
is that uh, the whole logic of supply chains has been always premised on economic efficiency. I think that is a non-negotiable uh, logic. And that will uh, logically, again, uh, sounds a bit tautological, but that logic logically will remain the fundamental when businesses look at supply chains in the foreseeable future, even in the long term. Now, the question over here is that to what extent, uh, if one looks at, let's say, for example, a different kind of supply chain, which is not as closely dependent on China as it is right now, to what extent does that supply chain address the logic of economic efficiency? It may not be the best option, but there is a way of probably taking it close to the best. And that is where uh, the loss of efficiency needs to be compensated. But again, it might not just be the financial part of it. There might be much more to it, which needs to be taken together. And uh, this is where countries have to upgrade the conversation that they're having on supply chains to a much more effective and much wider stakeholder engagement. It is probably not enough for the Ministry of External Affairs and Finance Ministries just to keep talking about resiliency in supply chains. Businesses now really need to come into the story in a far more effective fashion. And maybe uh, not just businesses, but even the legal community, because the rules, as we heard from Sarah in the uh, sort of NCMA context, the rules are going to be extremely important. The value addition, the sourcing rules, the rules of origin, there's going to be a considerable scope for disputes. So I think till that conversation happens, till the conversation is widened, broadened, and goes deep enough to give a confidence to the businesses that yes, it's worth taking the risk and making the shift. We might not see much happening. Okay, Kazuda, let me come to you on this because Japan's had experience, you know, given incidents earlier on with China. So I might present my, my, my sense would be that the business community, which I was always in my impression in Japan works much more closely with government than necessarily in other places what Amatendu is suggesting is already taking place in Japan. Is that fair? Um, yes, but no. I, I think what is going on in Japan right now is that the Japanese uh, in, industrial uh, federation called Keidanren is now um, putting the uh, proposals against the proposed bill, um, which is now under preparation for the economic security which is the from the business side this bill is um too restrictive and too you know uh punitive so that they want to make sure that you know where the where they draw a line and what are the items which needs to be concerned and what are the items which needs to be um which needs which are the out of scope of the uh, of the proposed bill so I, I think the, you know, it's, it's not the, the, the relationship between the government and industry on this matter is not as cozy as you can, you can imagine. I think this is a, from the, the government side, this is considered to be a, a security issue, whereas the, for business, this is about the optimum a supply chain issue, as uh, Amtindu has um, has mentioned. So I think the business interest and the uh, and the government interest are colliding each other, and I think uh, this is a, this is a hard problem to solve. Okay, I'm going to turn to you, Don, because your business you've been working with government. Are you uh, feeling that we're we're getting closer to being able to resolve these this sort of tension? Sorry, got to unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I think so. It's taken some time to get people fully kind of informed here on what it's going to take to get these going here. But I think we need to look at China and, and study how they managed to get into that leadership position that they are right now. And clearly they saw early on that you, to take advantage of the rare earth wealth they had they built out all the downstream manufacturing capacity and then inspired more manufacturers to get started in other areas on other elements that they could source from these 
resources that they have there. And that's a principle that we've never really applied here and we should be learning from it and be inspired to do the same thing here. Get the manufacturing on to create the demand. Um, uh, just follow I up just on that. Yes, this is going to be a big issue. Is you know we used to refine, uh, you know, from the mining industry, but we 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 do less and less of it for a number of reasons: cost, labor, uh, environmental concerns. It was easier to ship the stuff off to Asia and have it refined, especially in China, then buy it back. But you know that's not uh, prevailing wisdom now. We're saying, well, we actually should be doing all this here and. Certainly, listening to some of the, of the American legislators saying, well, why can't we do this? We're prepared to put money up front. Do you see that happening? Uh, certainly, the, you, 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 my sense is the political will is in moving in that direction. But as you made the point earlier about the demand side of it, and also business has got to be convinced that this is, this is an investment because government may put some investment in, but ultimately, most of this has got to come from business itself. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, I think the concept that we've got to really try to inspire more of is innovation on how to produce these in more efficient ways and not just apply traditional refining technologies, look at new opportunities to do it more efficiently. And that's starting to happen, actually, in, in um, many countries. And we see ways that we can take advantage of that here and hopefully inspire more of the research and development work that's needed to uh, innovate these new, more efficient extraction processes and more ways to use these rare elements because we got them and that's never happened because it's never been a part of the culture of the industry here. Colin, it's Sarah. Can I, can I add in on this as well? Please. I, I mean, I think that one of the things that's important to understand is that as we've moved through these last few years of innovation um, on battery electric vehicles, it, you know, things are happening at an exponential rate, right? So, you know, when, when automakers and when um, suppliers into the auto supply chain are looking at what they need to do, everything is moving at, at, a, at a super fast pace for an industry that has traditionally been um, a slower mover. On, on some of these things. So I think that one of the things that's been underestimated within government in general is the rate at which all of these um, products are going to need to be uh, you know, acquired within the regional markets that these vehicles are being um, built and, sell and sold into. So there's no appetite really. I, I think in general, this is true for consumers and for investors to see vehicles being shipped from one side of the earth to the other. There is a, there is a there's a push within multiple regions for localization of the supply chain from extraction all the way through to the final vehicle. And so I think this is something that we'll see kind of happening in, in an organic fashion. There are some parts that will you know, likely continue to come from you know, primarily from one region of, of, the, of the earth to another, but for the most part, there is a push to localize all of these things. And you see that in the, in the discussions with TSMC um, and with other you know, chip makers and moving factories into, into North America. It wasn't just a discussion on COVID and supply chain um, you know, reliability, a lot of that has to do with a localization that goes both to the regional value contents and to the actual carbon footprint of these vehicles as they're produced. Sarah, okay, I wanna follow up. When you talk about localization, are you talking about localization within a state or a region or in a kind of, you know, NAFTA Continent. we've created, we've got a, uh, three countries, we've made big efforts to try and raise the standards up the Americans are taking the Mexicans to basically court around labor and environmental uh, breakdowns that they, as they see it. Where does that leave Canada, the United States? Do you think that we are sufficiently a uh, high standard between the two of us to be able to do this? You know, I, I say this in context of what I see in Michigan when someone says, ah, we're not going to buy stuff parts from Canada anymore. Here's a good reason because of blockaded bridge. Should we be worried about that? Well, I think Canada always needs to be worried, just as Mexico is always worried when you have a giant partner as the third partner in your in your trio, right? And so I, I think that that's, you know, there is always advocacy that we need to do um, on behalf of Canada and on behalf of Mexico and to get into the supply chain continentally. But I think that the continental approach is the best approach because the reality is that the resources are spread throughout the continent and the market is spread throughout the continent. 
Phew, thank you. I was afraid we were losing you to another cause. I'm glad to see you're still a trilateralist. All right, Dave, give me another question, please. And just to remind the audience, pose your questions on the Q&A chat line and uh, Dave will pick them up and pose them. David. I was, I was going to add one thing. Oh, to please go ahead, Don. Saying, if I yeah, could. No, this is meant to be a conversation. So come in. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing that I like to remind people of it, that Sarah's probably well aware of is that technology in this emerging electric vehicle market, especially in the batteries, is still evolving. And it could be that the chemistries on some of these cathodes and anodes used in lithium ion batteries are going to keep changing, which will change the uh, exact product specifics that they're going to use in the future. So you've got to be able to also adapt to the change in the technologies like the battery technology going forward. I'm not sure if you're seeing that, Sarah, but uh, that's what I'm hearing and seeing. But it takes you back to your point about innovation because we're just not sure where this is all going. Exactly. So you have well, to be adaptable. It's, it's, it's inside the supply chain report that the United States put out. Like there is a push even within the government to establish a different kind of battery chemistry. Whether or not that comes to fruition is up for grabs still. But I think that the innovation is really critical because we're always looking to get, you know, that extra next hundred kilometers out of that battery. Um, and, you know, all of the OEMs and all of the different regions are working on what that, what that next edge is to get your vehicle, the, you know, the one that's got the leading technology and has the farthest range and can operate in the coldest temperatures, which is particularly dear to our hearts, I think. <laughs> which is an opportunity for collaboration between the automotive industry and aspiring producers of lithium, for sure. Yes. And before I leave this and move to Dave, I just have a question I'm going to pose to you, Stephen. Do you see within the quad and sort of the AUKUS for all these subgroups, particularly em emphasis on technology innovation, do you see that as, as places where this can happen within the Asian context? Well, I don't know if we can put the AUKUS agreement and the Quad in the same uh, category. I think that they're, they're fundamentally different kinds of agreements. But when we're thinking about cooperation in terms of specific areas of technology, uh, the Quad partners have already delineated uh, four or five areas that they can specifically cooperate in. And I think why that's important is that they believe that they have the comparative advantage to work together and to be competitive. And that goes back to your point uh, and uh, Amatindu's point about the market driving uh, the competition. And, and if, if, it, if it's not, if we don't have a competitive uh, uh, form of cooperation, it's not going to be sustainable. And I think that's really, really important. And this is why the Quad Partners have really focused on particular areas of technology, but also regulation, uh, which is, I think, going to be important in terms of developing new technologies. On the AUKUS agreements, um, setting aside the submarine, um, nuclear powered submarine uh, technologies and deterrence, um, the AUKUS agreement focuses on AI, quantum computing, cybersecurity, and probably hyper hypersonic um, missile systems. So. The AI and quantum computing really are, are an interesting area of technological cooperation, and they may provide uh, downstream benefits to how we think about many aspects of the digital economy, new technologies, and they may be a platform for developing new technologies that can help with building resilience. Uh, but at this stage, I think it's just too early to, to, to uh, chart out a course. Uh, maybe Kazuto has some, uh, some additional comments on these two particular areas. Kazuto, do you want to come in? Oh, yeah, um, there are these two areas, particularly the AI and the quantum technology, they are very strong competition. And China is now having a, some sort of a supremacy in, uh, in the technological superiority. So I, I, I think what is necessary today, or from the Japanese point of view, I, I think there is a sort of an element of catching up with, with the Chinese pace. So I think that's, uh, that's one of the, the points that the, uh, this new proposed bill on the economic security is putting a focus on the strengthening the um, uh, technological base in Japan and to make sure that we will have the international collaboration to, um, to, to, to encourage more innovation uh, together with the, uh, with the United States and the other um, uh, coalition partners. 
I just want to jump in there, Colin, because I think, um, and it, it goes back to one of your previous points. Uh, Japan is an interesting case uh, because it does about $210 billion of trade a year with China. That represents about 32% of its overall G, uh, its, its exports uh, annually. And this is at a time when um, unfavorable ratings of China are continue to remain at record highs. Um, so Japan is engaging with China, not in a zero-sum approach. It's still strengthening its trade relations through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. There's discussions about a trilateral free trade agreement between uh, South Korea, Japan, and China. And of course, um, China and Taiwan's uh, uh, accession to the uh, CTPP at least is being considered, although I don't think it's reality. Uh, so while Ch Japan is clearly uh, trying to recalibrate its economic relationship in specific sectors, yeah. it's still yeah. deepening its economic relations with China. And that balance really is going to inform how it continues to think about resilience of supply chains, as well as its economic security moving forward. So for Canada to think about resilient supply chains in the Indian Pacific, Japan to me represents a really good example of balancing um, you know, real economic benefits from that relationship, but some of the challenges that exist between that bilateral relationship. Okay, so we should be doing even more as you've been suggesting for some time, talking with the Japanese, how they do it because of the experience they've had, particularly given the fact that China is their, is still their biggest trading partner. All right, Dave, any, please, what have you got up uh, on the list? And again, just to remind the audience, use the Q&A function. Yes, and so uh, I'll try and synthesize out uh, these and, and I'll hold a, a, a follow on a set of questions about kind of the geopolitics about these and ask uh, two though that are about um, how can you make the adaptation resilience of the supply chain compatible with regional or trans-regional trade agreements. So what's the linkage between these various uh, supply chain focused efforts and, and the wider uh, parameters of, of negotiated trade agreements, uh, either regionally or, or trans-specifically. Uh, and then another question about how, uh, what some have been suggesting about the potential for uh, localization of supply chain efforts. How can that be rectified with um, the, the wider globally integrated supply chain system since localization, localization would um, in practicality be effectively a deglobalization of a global supply chain system? So uh, trade agreements, multilateral, regional, and then localization, and, and, but still keeping global integration. Okay, good question. The, the whole idea of localization, as you point out, how is that going to work when with globalization and then the resiliency piece that fits into it as well that you described. Um, who'd like to start on this? Amitindu? Uh, Colin, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Colin, I think uh, both the questions extremely interesting. And let me uh, sort of try to address the first one first. I think the way uh, things are shaping, we can look at uh, the whole question of reorganization according to three blocks of industries. The first, where uh, supply chains are really fundamentally driven by resources access to physical resources, which are basically, let's say, for example, one example could be the rare arts, critical minerals, so on and so forth. Another uh, box could be supply chains, which are primarily technology driven. So let's say, for example, AI, uh, quantum computing, or, or any other dual use nature of technology. And the third is uh, probably a box where all the rest fit in. And this is where arriving at uh, partnership agreements and trade agreements are probably going to be the easiest. So let's say, for example, if one looks at uh, large segments of the digital trade, even the digital currency driven trade that is taking place between countries, it is quite easy to fit those supply chains within the framework of, let us say, an existing agreement like the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement that has come up between Singapore, Chile, and New Zealand, and it can be expanded further. Uh, when one looks at the second category of uh, supply chains in the reverse order, the ones that are technology driven and technology intensive, it is also possible to overlook the logic of geographical contiguity or physical boundaries and think of arrangements between countries which are not specifically trade agreements, but probably comprehensive economic cooperation agreements, if one can define them in that form. And the quad could be an example of that because the quad is hardly geographically contiguous. But the biggest problem is going to come in the first category of uh, industries, which are actually resource intensive. 
And this is where working out uh, any kind of trade agreements are going to be very, very difficult because there are countries which are currently positioned at the upper runs of the ladders as far as their access to these minerals and materials are concerned. I mean, China, for example, is completely preponderant as far as its command over the rare art uh, global market is concerned. So that's the sector where really working out FTAs are going to be most difficult. And addressing the question of localization, Colin, I think this is eventually, uh, again, uh, going back to, uh, to a situation where production across the world is going to get segmented. And this is a segmentation that will follow the geopolitical underpinnings. I, I don't know whether it will be right to say that it's going back to the Cold War. But I think one of the biggest benefits of the end of the Cold War was the fact that the world could be utilized much more effectively as a global production hub. Today, I think there is a step back from that. So if we see the production parceling out in these kind of specific blocks, obviously economic efficiency is being compromised. And I completely agree with the concern that has been raised in the question. Yes, costs are certainly going to go up. Costs are going to go up, customers are going to get affected, and to what extent that will remain an acceptable solution is what we will have to wait and watch. No, oh, and as you say, costs go up, but that means prices go up. And yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, there, there is a cost. To this. All right, uh, Kazuda, do you want to come in on this? Because Japan's oh, had yes. a lot of experience, please. Oh, yes. Um, I, I think one of the issues with regard to the, the, the alignment with the uh, trade agreement is the the magic word is the security exemption. Um, I think that the RCEP and the TPP has their own um, security exemption clause, which can be very arbitrarily, and uh, you can you, there, there is a lot of um, uh, room to maneuver uh, for the governments to define how to how, what 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 sort of security we're talking about. Um, however, the WTO has a very limited uh, the 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 gut uh, twenty one uh, that gut art, article twenty one is the clause which defines the um, security exemption but I think the the scope is very narrow um, compared to uh, TSM um, RCEP and the um, and TPP so I think there there are uh, I, I think there is a big hurdle on the WTO issue, but uh, since WTO is not fully functioning today, um, the many countries have just override the I, this um, limits of the uh, of, of the free trade agreement um, by using this excuse of the um, security um, security exemption. Um, in terms of localization, I, I think one of the, I agree with uh, Amtindu uh, about um, the, uh, there are differences among the uh, industry. And one of which uh, Amtindu has um, uh, mentioned about the, uh, the digital um, uh, alliance. And I think the um, data localization is one thing that is under uh, a, a big concern because the uh, China has certain um, regulation to localize their data so that they can uh, <clears throat> they can monopolize the data and also they they, they there is the a link between the so that uh, the data localization law allows the government to intervene and the and and to control over the data so that has been a problem so uh, i think there are number of the uh, issues with regard to the data localization and i think uh, the under tpp the data localization is not uh, not allowed in in the TPP uh, members, so I, I think this is going to be a very hard, uh, uh, tough issue for the Chinese accession to the to the CPTPP. Oh, I think that's right. I think as I was having that lunch today with our former ambassador to Japan, who was later our ambassador to WTO, and a couple of Brits. Uh, the Brits, of course, have applied for CPTPP, and we were saying how soon and uh, to echo what you just uh, said, Sudo, in terms of China, you start going through the various succession things, it's going to be some time. 
So, so Stephen, do you want to come in on this? Because I know this is an area that you follow as well. Well, I, I just want to touch upon that question about localization. And I think that today's discussion and the idea about resilient supply chains seems to be focused on the fact that um, countries like uh, Canada, Japan, and, and United States, Australia are slowly recalibrating supply chains. But I think that it's important for us to note that um, China is also recalibrating um, its um, economic relations with other countries and its supply chains. Um, they've initiated, of course, the Made in China 2025 initiative. We don't talk about it now, but really was about um, replacing a lot of the, uh, the technological dependency on the West and on the United States. Um, we also see the dual circulation strategy, which is trying to recalibrate its own economy to boost domestic consumption and shift away from a Western oriented export based economy. So this recalibration, this localization or shifting of, of, of trade and supply chains isn't just being driven by, I think, um, Western countries. Uh, China as well is, has their own perspective on these particular issues. And it's going to be the interaction of this, this interplay of, of China's attempts to uh, you know, I have a selective decoupling or selective diversification away from the West. And I think um, Japan and the US and Canada's efforts uh, to uh, recalibrate supply chains and trade relationships. It's going to be the interplay of this, this which is going to be um, the future of supply chains within the region. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's more complicated than just thinking about localization. It's, it's a very interactive process. And I don't think this story has, has really been written yet. Oh, and as you point out, the divorce proceedings have uh, on both sides there are pressures. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Don, do you want to come? Because you've been trying to explore this. Do you, John, do you have a comment on sort of localization resiliency? Sorry, you were asking me or? Uh, yes, I wondered if you wanted to come in on this one. I didn't really have anything to add on this one specifically. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Before I move to the next question, yes, anything please. Like that? Yeah, I, I think it, I think there is a very real understanding that um, costs are going to go up for consumers, um, and we're in the middle of kind of these inflationary pressures that we're kind of considering as being post-COVID. But I, I'd argue that they were coming even before we had to deal with um, the implications of the pandemic. I, I think that there is a um, that you know, throughout the Trump administration, we started to see these inflationary pressures because we were looking at at um, bringing the supply chains back to North America. And I think that you know, to be honest, I, I think most North Americans are prepared um, to deal with some of this, you know, uh, you know some of these increased prices, um, and they don't really have much choice in the end. I think you know, we already see that you know, new vehicles are going to be more expensive, um, and it's not just because the supply chain is is going to be more expensive; it's because the actual technology technology involved in the vehicles. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into you know, the discussion on, um, on inflation and on increasing prices for consumers. But I think that you know, it, it, comes, it brings to mind this kind of cyclical um, you know, acquisition versus simplification that we talk about in the, in the consumer environment. Um, and I think we're in, we, were, we spent a long time, I think, you know, in the in the early two in, in the early part of this century, where where we were really focused on consumerism and cheap goods and ensuring that people had access to whatever it was they wanted, and now we're turning away from that in some ways into a, a more consolidated, simplified understanding of what it means to have you know to have to spend a lot of money to get something that you really want and then have to hold on to that and so the pushback on planned obsolescence the pushback on um, some of these other uh, consumer protection and um, pieces of legislation that we see in Canada and the United States are all part of that and so I think you know it all goes hand in hand in the end so we just revert back a couple of generations when everything lasted and you just kept enjoying it so that get used to that car because your grandson may be driving it. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Sarah, thank you. Let's move in this next section, I think, to geopolitics. David uh, uh, signaled that there are a number of questions there. We have about 10 minutes left. So Dave, do you wanna set us up with uh, uh, the, the question that we'll then go through? So I'll, I'll 
uh, take a couple together and lump them into basically two categories. One, there's a couple asking basically about what the right balance is between industry and government and trying to, to uh, recalibrate supply chain arrangements. So uh, broadly, the thoughts about how much or what type of relationship needs to be struck between those two entities to, to work this through. And then related to that um, is the whole geopolitical overlay and the potential for conflict, uh, particularly in the Pacific, uh, as we're seeing play out right now in Eastern Europe. Uh, how much of the concern and balancing of the risk um, on conflict interruption in uh, specific terms shape thoughts about where we make sourcing arrangements? Okay, thanks, Dave. Well, look, in the terms of industry and business, Don, I'd like to move to you to start off on that one because you've spent much of your career doing that, that dance between industry and business. And I'd be interested to see how you see that going forward and some of the lessons you've learned through your experience. So, Don? Well, one thing I've learned here in Canada is that um, when you're starting to do innovation with these non-traditional commodities, the um, regulations, if there are minerals coming out of the ground, the regulations uh, in place at the provincial level need to adapt to how different it is to produce them. And that's one of the things I've been trying to inspire here in Ontario is to actually regulate non-traditional commodities like lithium under a separate act that recognizes the fundamental differences um, to producing them compared to a traditional commodity like copper or gold. And um, it's taken a while, but I'm getting there actually. We'll treat it as an advanced manufacturing sector. And I think if we do that, change the rules so that it and actually helps new producers get started, we're, we're off to the races. Don, you point out a, a, an, an important fact here, and that is you said you're dealing with the Ontario government, which again reminds our audience that we're dealing with federations with state, uh, provincial constitutional responsibilities and who takes the lead. Uh, you know, we, there's a tendency for us always to th toss everything to the federal government, but I, my sense is your experience would say no, uh, much of this is probably dealing with municipal governments in particular, and sometimes sorry, provincial governments in particular, but sometimes municipal even. Uh, yes, because the mining industry has always been regulated under provincial legislation. So you've got to work with that. And then on the local level these days, it's about the duty to consult and uh, being able to basically inform First Nations on the opportunities that these new materials represent. And I've been doing a lot of work on that because I think the potential is enormous because there's a lot of First Nations in Northern Ontario that are still basically stuck in the poverty trap. And these new non-traditional commodities that could be produced in very sustainable ways and at a small scale offer great opportunities, especially lithium, because I keep telling people we've got hundreds of lithium pegmatites across Northern Ontario Let's take advantage of them and create more economic development opportunities for our Indigenous communities. Don, I, I've seen this work very well in terms of hydroelectricity. So what you're suggesting is that this could work uh, even better, just as well, on things like the new minerals, the critical minerals, lithium, with tribes which may not have hydropower, but have got them the, the, the resources that we're talking about in the ground. And that yes. involves not just getting a share of the investment, perhaps participating, I mean, in terms of jobs, you're, I guess that's your point, is that they're, this is this could be their ticket out of poverty. Yes, and even having ownership of the business that yeah. develops it, or at least part ownership to start, yes. And are, are you actually talking with tribes now, and what are they looking for, like 10%, 30%? I remember talking years ago around the pipeline, uh, the, the oil companies were saying, well, we somewhere to between 10 and 30% is what we've we come through. Are, are you getting down to that sort of discussion level? Uh, yeah, but it's also about being a service provider too, in some cases, so that the people in the community can start to get better informed on what the skill sets are they need to be able to um, participate in this new industry. That's interesting. So business is, in a sense, taking the lead where government's used to and then turning to government. So, okay, help us now make this possible. Exactly. So it really yeah. is a tripartite, but especially when we talk First Nations, the regional or local government and business. Well, and as you point out in Quebec, and it's true at elsewhere in Canada, there are many examples of First Nations that have successfully participated in the economy. The yeah. Cree Nation in Quebec, they're the leaders of the economy in northern Quebec there now. 
And it's the same thing in Nova Scotia where I grew up. Big Ma Nation, our business leaders in several communities there. Sarah, let me move to you. You've got two parts to this, but I'm particularly interested in the business government interface. And the business government interface. <laughs> that's that's a lot specialty. of what you do. You you live it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> both, from Every both day. sides. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that I think is really important, especially in this moment in time, is that industry is is turning to government and saying, look, you know, we're we're all in this together on this movement towards a lower carbon future. And so you're asking us not only to look at what we're producing, but how we're producing it. And at the same time, we're responsible still for jobs um, in the traditional part of the sector as we make this transition. So, you know, we have to ensure that, um, you know, the economic footprint um, in, in different jurisdictions remains healthy that's a lot to ask of, of business. And so there is a push, I think uh, fairly so, to say to government, make this easier on us. So whether that's, um, you know, tax breaks, whether it's, um, you know, gifts in kind, um, you know, you see it throughout the United States that many jurisdictions will give land, they'll give tax breaks, they'll give um, cash money. You know, we've, we've got the Strategic Innovation Fund here in Canada, which is really um, important um, as part of that as part of the greening of the economy and you see it being deployed as such. And I think it's a very effective tool. And so, you know, in the long run, there's no way that industry can do this alone and there's no way that government can do this alone. So the more that you can keep that conversation open um, and have a, you know, a, a, a trusting conversation, it's really critical that government understands that they are not the experts on industry and that industry understands that government has a responsibility to its citizens. Well, thank you, Sarah. Now, there's two parts to that question. So I'm going to move to you, Kazuto, and say, look, the, on the geopolitics side that Dave raised, do you want to make a comment there? Because you're living in it. Yes. I, one of the problem is that the, the, the geopolitics is not in favor of it, not playing easy on Japan. I think um, the very much concern is the increase of the um, military capability of China. And I think the new technology is certainly contributing to the development of the Chinese military capabilities. So I think there is a very strong concern about the transfer of technology. And th this is one part of the uh, Japanese proposed bill on the uh, economic security. There is a strengthening of the control over the transfer of technology, employing the uh, foreign nationals, including China, uh, or particularly focusing on the Chinese students and the researchers uh, hired by the strategic industry. And also there is uh, a, a, a proposed proposal for the amendment of the patent law to uh, to set up the uh, undisclosed uh, 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 patents. And um, there, there is a lot of uh, geopolitics playing into this uh, economic security issue. And meanwhile, I, I think the, um, there is a very strong concern about the Chinese use of the economic coercion. So how to prepare for the, such uh, an attempt by China. And I think this is one of the reasons why there is a strong discussion on the resilience and the economic, uh, the supply chain. So it takes me back to the Cold War when we had COCOM to sort of manage transfer of technology, export controls, um, yep. ITARs on the American part. It really yep. is back to the future. Amitendu, do you want to come in on this? Well, in one uh, very last thought, I think I'm, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the countries who are in the game, who are trying to reorganize supply chains. I think one of the very important uh, structural limitations which these countries have to address is that within themselves, within their systems and institutions, it's very important that the stakeholders understand that trade can no longer be looked at in exclusion and decisions related to supply chains need to be looked at through a prism combining foreign policy, security, industrial organization, and trade. I think Canada, uh, Australia also is an excellent example of countries who have combined within the government foreign policy and trade expertise through the DFAT kind of arrangements. But unfortunately, there are many other countries where these stakeholders continue to stay distant and apart. 
I think that is where several countries are going to find themselves deficient in addressing the new challenges that geopolitics has posed in the context of supply chain resilience. It's very much there. All right, Stephen, I'm going to give you the last word for this uh, webinar, which is coming to a close. And I think it's appropriate that it should go to you who did so much to make this possible, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I think all my colleagues have really highlighted the incredible complexity of thinking about resilience of supply chains within the Indo-Pacific, uh, the intersection of industry, government, uh, innovation, uh, uh, trade agreements. Um, we really sit at a, a, a crossroads of rethinking about um, economic uh, security, trade relations and foreign policies. And this is going to be increasingly difficult as I think uh, supply chains and trade will be increasingly used uh, to pressure states to change their behavior. And with that, I do think that uh, on the uh, th this year, uh, today is uh, the uh, first anniversary of, of Canada spearheading the, uh, the, the act against arbitrary detention uh, really uh, does pave a way for, I think, countries like Canada, working with like-minded countries really to build uh, new kinds of diplomatic initiatives really to uh, make uh, the weaponization of supply chains and trades a no-go zone. Uh, working together to find a way to create diplomatic pressure on countries that engage in this kind of behavior. Uh, by doing that, I think that we can create a platform or we can create the trust that I think um, uh, Sarah mentioned in terms of uh, how we think about trade and supply chains. Um, and that is something that we need to explore. And maybe Canada can work with Japan and, and other countries to really think about how we can create a, a new collection of countries that will work together to ensure that um, trade and supply chains isn't uh, used as a, as a tool to uh, shape our uh, political choices back home. Stephen, Last you've thing. just given us some wonderful ideas for the next uh, webinars that we want to hold. In, in hoping to keep with our time frame, though, I, I, my thanks to all of you, uh, each of the panelists, uh, Stephen Nagy, who has been responsible for bringing this together, uh, Professor Suzuki, uh, Dr. Amatendu Pellet, Don Bubber, and uh, my friend and CGI fellow, uh, Sarah Goldfeder. Again, the papers on which the presentations were based are available in English and French on the CJA website. Please do look at them. An edited version of this webinar will become a forthcoming Global Exchange podcast, and the webinar will eventually be available on YouTube. My thanks again to CJI fellow Stephen Neji for taking the lead in organizing tonight, to CJI President David Perry for admirably fielding the questions and putting them all together in coherent form, and especially to our producer, Charlotte Duval Antoine, who makes this happen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Colin Robertson on behalf of CJAI. Thank you.